everyone. My name is Elsa Lee. I'm the clinical director here at Transforming Life Center at Asset School. This is my second month here living on the island. So I am really excited to be here. First time speaking to this particular crowd. As a staff of ACIDS, I have spoken in other places, I teach, and this is a very, this is a unique experience. When you can see the mountains and the sky and the clouds and you can talk about serious stuff like this, this is great. So on that note, I'm going to talk a little bit about definition, the definition of dyslexia. Now there are many different definitions of dyslexia, but we're going to stick with one just for, there's one main reason why I'm going to talk about that. Um, just for simplicity's sake, and also it's important for us to have a common language to explain what we're dealing with, right, when we think about dyslexia, reading disability. You're going to hear many different terms that people use, but we're going to stick with this one definition for the purpose of, um, for me to be, be able to explain to you uh, what dyslexia means and what we can do in terms of interventions. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the role of assessment. So my job here is to do assessments, right? I think I've, I might have met maybe one or two of you here, I'm not sure. Um, but my role here is to provide evaluations and do these psycho educational psychological assessments for students who may or may not be at risk for dyslexia and other um, conditions that we'll talk about. All right, so just very briefly, three main objectives. What, do I, what would I like for you guys to walk away with? Definition of dyslexia, what it looks like, and the role of assessment. Now, I'm going to try, oh, there's a lot of words here, so don't worry about it. This is the definition of dyslexia. So where did I take that from? If you do a Google search of dyslexia, you're gonna be able to find this definition in most of the websites you find. Why? Because this is something that was formulated by the International Dyslexia Association. And this is by far one of the most agreed um, definition when we try to explain dyslexia, and there's a lot of consensus around it, a lot of research has been done. Now, why did I pick this one? Because it, it contains a lot of important components in explaining and understanding dyslexia. Now, it's a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. So hold on to that thought. It's neurobiological in origin. I'm going to unpack what that means, the science behind that. It's characterized by a couple of things. Difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, poor spelling, and decoding abilities. Now, these difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is unexpected, often unexpected in relation to other cognitive difficulties or cognitive abilities, excuse me, and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Again, it's a mouthful, I'll unpack that. There are secondary consequences to this. It's gonna include problems in reading comprehension, um, reduced reading experience, so that's gonna impede the growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. What does all of this mean? Now, I'm gonna highlight the couple of things that I would like for you to be able to walk away with, and when you work with your own child, or when you talk to someone about dyslexia, if your child comes up to you and asks, mom or dad, what, what am I dealing with? What is dyslexia? My friend tells me about this thing, and I have no idea what, why, what is this? You're gonna be able to have the language and knowledge to explain this to them. Now, neurobiological. So, neurobiological in origin, what does that mean? That means this is a disorder it's a condition that is brain-based, so it's based on the brain. There is something going on in the brain that can explain this. This is a not made-up stuff. Now, this is something that I stole <laughs> from Dr. Shaywitz. So uh, some of you may have um, heard or read her book. She is very famous. She's really known um, throughout the world, and she wrote this book called Overcoming Dyslexia. And what this is showing here is that um, this is a brain, and you're looking at the left hemisphere of the brain, so there are two hemispheres of our brain, left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So we're dealing with the left hemisphere mainly when we deal with language because that is predominantly the hemisphere that can explain how we understand language, how we process reading um, and information as such. So you see there are three main areas. So these are the th um, three main neural systems in explaining reading and language processing. Now, we're going to focus on the red and the yellow first because those are the two main areas that we, could, we would see um, the brain light up when we do neuroimaging studies like the functional MRI. Um, so when you ask someone to do reading or when you, uh, you know, sit in the machine and you know, the researcher asks you, hey, can you read this word out loud? You know, you're going to go through something called the decoding. That's something that Darlene had just talked about. Two areas light up, the red area and the yellow area lights up. So what is the red area? It's the parietal temporal lobe in the brain, and it is responsible for phonological processing. So when you try to decode, when a child tries to decode a word, a word that they've never seen before, 
that part of the brain lights up. And this is the brain of a typical reader, all right? The yellow part of the brain is called the occipital temporal lobe. That is more to the posterior. Posterior means the back of the brain. These two areas more to the left posterior side of the brain. Now, don't worry about the jargon. Don't worry about the terminology if you're not familiar with the brain. I just want you to have an understanding that there are actual differences. So in the occipital temporal part of the brain, that part also lights up. What is that responsible for? Um, you'd see more developing readers who are trying to recognize words by sight. That is the part that's responsible for that. What about the green area? The green area is more in the anterior part of the brain. Anterior simply means the, front, the frontal area. That is responsible for executing language, expressing language. You're coming up with words, analyzing, articulating. Now, again, let me remind you, this is the brain of a typical reader. So what did Dr. Shaywitz do in her research studies? So she tried to compare the brains between the non-impaired readers and the dyslexic readers. So on the left side of the brain, left side of the brain, I'm sorry, left side of the screen, you see that that's the same one as uh, the, the brain that I just showed you in the previous slide. On the right side is the brain imaging of the dyslexic reader. What do you see? There's an overactivation in the Broca's area. So right, so you see that there's a bigger, lar larger green circular area in the Broca's area. And then there's an underactivation in the temporal parietal and the occipital temporal area, which are the two main areas for phonological processing and for word recognition. Now, we're not sure why that's the case, but this is what they call, they meaning the researchers call the neurosignature of dyslexia. So you do see that when dyslexic readers try to read, it's not that they cannot read, but they do see that there is a difference in terms of the processing and the wiring. There is an underactivation in those two areas that I was just talking about, the red and the yellow area, but the green area somehow is more activated, it's overactivating. Why is that the case? There are different theories to explain that, but one possible theory is that dyslexic readers try to overcompensate by using their frontal system. So they try really hard to make sense of what they see by using other parts of the brain so that they can articulate the word, but it's much slower. And that's why we hear a lot of problems with fluency. So this is one of the, ex you know, the experiences that dyslexic readers would go through. And this is in part because of the differences in their neurosystem. Now, second part of the definition. We talked about difficulties, the, the way that we characterize dyslexia. Difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition. So word recognition, this is a term that you guys probably have heard a lot about. Darlene just talked about it in depth um, with a lot of details. So word recognition in a, you know, in a more layman's term, it's pretty much like sight word reading, right? We all know what sight words are. We've tried to teach our kids sight words. You give them a list of words. You try to have them be able to identify the words quickly, automatically, instantly. So the key here with word recognition is not to sound out the word one by one. It's really to have the kid to be able to see the word and be able to say it immediately out loud. There's a lot of automaticity. There's a, it's almost like an instant process. Now, why is that important? You can imagine, if you were to read a passage, right? Let me see if I have one. Oh, I have one, okay. So there's a passage here. I forgot about the orders of my slides, sorry. Um, so when you read something like this, to you it's pretty, you know, assuming that we all have pretty skilled readers here, you can look at something like this and go, when I'm feeling sad or grumpy, I like to look at colors. It's fluent, you're able, you don't have to sound out the words one by one and decode them in order to, to know what the passage is about, right? It's so, it's automatic. You don't have to put in that extra effort. But you can imagine for a dyslexic reader, that's not the case, why? Because they need to decode the words one by one. And by the time they're done decoding, they're exhausted. They have no idea how to connect the words. So this is, in part, going to explain why reading comprehension is so hard. If you have a reader at home who seems to be okay with sounding out words, you know, it's not a problem with their decoding, but somehow they just don't get it. Well, this is one of the reasons why, because they're really slow and they put a lot of attention in being able to decode the word. So they really miss the main point. What is the big picture? I don't know. But you just read it. I don't know. Right? So it's not that they're not trying. It's just that they're not able to connect the ideas because by the time they're done reading, they're done. So that's, what, that's one of the you know, key deficits that we see in children with dyslexia, which is word recognition is very difficult for them. Now, another um, characteristic of dyslexia, poor spelling, probably not surprising, self-explanatory. What is poor spelling? Um, children who have difficulties decoding, ch children who have difficulties um, reading will usually have trouble with spelling. Now, why is that? Because if you think about spelling simple words like cat, right? Most kids, 
even dyslexic readers would be able to do that because they can sound it out. It's phonetic spelling, k, at. You put the three sounds, phonemes together, you got cat, C-A-T. However, if we are dealing, if they're dealing with words that are irregular, irregular words such as sword, like the samurai sword, S-W-O-R-D, why the heck is there a W in there? I don't know. Right? If you spell sort out, it should be S-O-R-D, shouldn't it? So the kids look at you and go like, why? why? Where's the W? It's silent? How am I going to remember that? Well, yeah, it's really hard. This is why they struggle. Now, on the left side of this page, um, that's what I took from the internet because I think it's really, it's a fantastic example. On the right side is an actual patient, that student that I just recently saw. So you can see on the left side of the page, right, there's a word like stop. So the child was able to spell it correctly, stop, S-T-O-P, why? Because it's a high frequency word, it's a word that you know, most people encounter all the time and phonetically it makes sense, stop. Other words, school, S-C-O-O-L. I mean, if you sound it out, it still said school, but where's the H? It's a wrong spelling. Look at the right side, fifth, big, table, chair, horse, make. All of these are not spelled correctly because you're relying on phonetic, the conventional spelling rules that no longer work for words that are not spelt uh, you know, according to the regular rules. Now on the right side, so this is someone that I just recently tested. So this is a fourth grade student. Um, he was able to get, to get the simpler words, more high frequency words correct. You've got cat, in, be, game, until he, went, he got to fix. So the actual word that I asked him to spell was fix, F-I-X. He spelled F-I-C-K-S. It still sounds right. So, you know, when the child has trouble um, being able, to, if they have trouble understanding the letter sound relationship, it's going to make it really hard for them to spell words phonetically or non phonetically. However, for students who have more severe cases of dyslexia, you're going to see that they're, they're going to have a lot of difficulty, especially with irregular words. We've got mother, night, page, began. On the right side of the page, windy, camped, and suspect. So at that point, testing was, uh, at least for that one subtest, it was terminated because there's no, I have enough information to decide that spelling is really difficult for him. Decoding. Now decoding, again, it's a term that you, know, you may have heard a lot of times before. Darlene just talked about it as well. Decoding um, is simply defined as the knowledge. This is the textbook definition. It's really the knowledge of you know, how letter and sounds relate to one another, how they connect with one another. Why is it important? If you see a word, let's say the word cat, C-A-T, you don't know how to say the word. What are you going to do? Right? Pretend that you are a preschooler. It's the first time you look at these words. You go, either it's a sight word that you've learned in school, or you're going to try to sound it out based on what you know. Um, k -at, right? That's the decoding process. And then you can sound it out and pronounce it correctly. What about words that are irregular or words that are just, you know, not frequent, frequently seen? Now, I've included a couple of the pseudo, what we call pseudo words. Um, we always test for decoding with a task or one of the tasks, and it's called the pseudo word decoding. Reason for that is because it's a very pure measure of how the child is actually able to decode the word without relying on word recognition. So words like, you can say, well, cat, sing, play, job, these are very high frequency words. Maybe the child's really having trouble with decoding, but they just somehow memorized it. They remembered how to say it. So we're not testing what it really needs to be tested. So we're going to throw out a couple of like weird looking words. L-O-Y, what is that? R-O-R-I-X, what, what is that? This is what really gets them tripped up because they will look at you and this is not a real word. I said, I know it's not a real word, just read it as if it is. So they go, okay, j om, j j j j right? L l l l l right? So th th then that gives me information. Okay, they're really having decoding difficulties. So in order for you to be able to read the word, I, I assume that most people are here are able to decode these words, even though they're not, that they're not real words. The word jum, how do, how do we get to the word jum? It rhymes with the word room, right? So what you're actually doing in a split second is, oh, let me go search in my lexicon and look for a word that rhymes somehow or reminds me of another word that I actually know. It shortens the amount of time that I actually need to try to sound it out. Oh, June. Oh, why? Because I'm replacing the phoneme, the r sound with the j. So I put it together, I blend it together, it becomes June. Easy. Well, no, not so much easy. It's not easy for dyslexic readers. Now, I'm going to give you a task. Raise your hand only if you don't know this word. What? Everyone knows? Oh, okay. 
no fun. Anyway, so most people, everyone here knows how to say this word for, for real? Yeah? Okay. Yay, okay, so everyone is a Mary Poppins fan. So, if, let's just imagine that you've never seen this word, you've never watched Mary Poppins, and somebody throws this word at you, your child decides to, like, you know, test you, um, which was what my kid did anyway, so, she, and she goes, she came home and she goes, I learned a new word, I bet you don't know. So she showed it to me, I'm like, wow, this is really hard, let me try to sound it out. This is decoding, right, when you don't know a word, which I'm sure all of us have encountered these situations. You, you open your Time magazine and you go, wow, I'm pretending that I know all the words, but I don't. There are definitely gonna be vocabs that we've never read or never learned before. What are you gonna do first thing? You're gonna decode it. You're gonna try to sound it out and look for that word. Wait, did I, have I heard this word before? Yeah, it, it sounds, oh, this is the meaning, this is the word, this is what we do. So adults do that too. So next time when you see a child struggle with their decoding, try to be empathic. They're really working hard towards breaking the word down into segments and trying to sound it out. Okay, phonological. So these difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. What does phonological mean? So textbook, textbook definition. It's the ability to quickly and correctly hear, store, recall, and make different speech sounds. What does that mean? It simply means the ability for someone to be able to play with, manipulate, make sense, understand, process the sounds in a word, in spoken words. Um, going back to the word cat, right? So the phonological, the phonemes that make up the word cat, there are three, so it's k, at, right? This is the poor cat always gets used as an example all the time. So, because it's easy, right? Everyone can relate to that. So cat, so there are three phonemes, k, at, and you gotta be aware of the fact that there are three phonemes in the word cat in order for you to be able to even try to sound it out. Phonological processing is such a critical aspect for readers, any readers. It, this is a common challenge for a lot of dyslexic readers because, in fact, a, at least half, if not more, 60% of the readers who have, who've been identified as dyslexic struggle with phonological processing. So what that means is they don't have the awareness of phonemes. When you hear a word like sing, you're gonna think, okay, it begins with the letter S because it goes S. Not so easy for dyslexic readers. So they actually lack the ability to hear, the ability to hear or to link the, the connection between the letter and the sound. For some of the kids, it comes very easy. For typical readers, it comes very easy. You look at the letter S and then immediately the child goes S. Oh, I can sound it out. Right? So that's a very simplistic example, but you get the idea. So that is the phonological processing that is usually a deficit for dyslexic readers, which will in turn affect their ability to decode and to read fluently, and hence their reading comprehension, and so on. Now, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into much detail, but by definition, dyslexia is diagnosed in spite of adequate cognitive abilities, meaning when somebody has uh, trouble reading, it's not necessarily, it's not because they don't have enough cognitive abilities, it's not because of their IQ. In fact, people with all ranges of IQ can have dyslexia, right? This is like one of the number one myths that have been debunked, hopefully, at this point. Everyone now knows now, you guys know. So it, it can happen to anyone with any IQ ranges. You can have a, an extremely gifted child with an IQ score of 135 and still not be able to read fluently Right? And the parents get frustrated. You know, what is going on with you? Aren't you smart? You're so smart. You're so smart. Everyone says you're so smart. Why can't you read this? It's so frustrating. No, it has nothing to do with their IQ. Just because they can read or decode a word does not, does not mean that they're not smart. They're still as smart as they are. They're two different, um, they're two different skills, if you will. Now, I hesitate in saying that because they're so, still somehow related. So there are plenty of studies that support, um, you know, the the argument that um, some students actually have a higher risk or they're more likely to struggle with reading because they also have what we call a comorbid condition. For instance, ADHD, working memory difficulties, executive functioning difficulties. So these students actually do have a harder time than an average reader to be able to read fluently or to be able to decode for various reasons, which um, if we have time, we'll get to that, but I don't want to digress too much. Um, effective classroom instruction is also on there um, in, in the definition because um, we can't diagnose dyslexia unless we know that effective classroom instruction is provided. Now, 
I would say for the most part in the American education system, in a typical classroom setting, I would give, I would just check off that box. Right? We're talking more about, let's say, there is a new student who just moved to this country um, from a non-English speaking country, and the teacher looks at the child and go, wow, you're seven, but you can't read cat. Well, it's not because the child is dyslexic, it's because there's not an effective classroom instruction that is done in English. So we can't diagnose dyslexia and that it makes no sense. Reading comprehension and vocabulary problems are secondary issues. Reading comprehension, I think Darlene had explained in more depth. Um, I kind of touched on that as well. Vocabulary, how does that uh, affect vocabulary? So if you've heard of this term called Matthew effect, so the rich gets richer, the poor gets poorer. Good readers end up becoming better readers and better readers, and they have a large archive of vocab. They have a great lexicon. Reason is because if, if you're naturally a good reader, you're gonna find reading appealing. You're gonna keep reading and reading and reading, so you're gonna gain a lot of knowledge. As opposed to children who just are poor readers, they're not gonna find reading interesting. They're gonna avoid it at all cost. They're, they might ask for an audio book. They might ask for you to read to them. And by the way, just because a child is dyslexic does not mean they don't enjoy listening to stories. It's quite the opposite. In fact, I've tested so many students and they would go like, no, I love hearing stories. I, I love it when my mom reads to me. It's just that when I have to look at it myself, they go like, no, no. So the students, if students who are poor readers to begin with are less likely to pick up a book and you know, it's a vicious cycle. If they're less likely to pick up a book, they're less likely to you know, obt obtain more information, learn new words, that's gonna shrink their vocab archive. Now, why should we even diagnose dyslexia? I hope that's a very, I hope that's a rhetorical question. Of course we need to diagnose dyslexia. Why else would I be here tonight? So, but there are actual reasons because we want to identify the problem early without an actual diagnosis, without the label. I mean, the, la the term label seems to be very loaded. I've had parents who come to me and say, please just don't say anything to my child. I don't want them to know anything about the word dyslexia. I say, well, I, don't, I won't say anything to the child because I don't even know what the results are yet. This is my first day meeting them, so I'm not gonna say anything. But I can tell the, you know, the, the stigma, the negative, connotation surrounding the idea of dyslexia and how much it can be really hurtful and harmful for parents and, and children alike. Because it's almost like, wow, you know, I don't want to be associated with a D word. You can call it anything, but just don't say dyslexia. Well, I'm a clinician. I'm going to call it dyslexia because it's a medical condition. You know, if you have a cold, you're not going to shy away from it and say, I don't have a cold. I have symptoms. No, if it's a cold, it's a cold. If it's dyslexia, you call it dyslexia. Um, because you need a label to be able to identify what the actual problem is. If you, don't ha if you don't know what the issue is, how are you gonna decide on interventions? How are you going to convince the school to give you effective instructions? You need the diagnosis. Um, well, gladly, for most of you who are here at Assets, you don't even need to convince anyone because we're already doing it. So, necessary accommodations, that's another thing. Now, if you're dealing with um, like state legislations who will actually fight you, in providing the accommodations that you actually need because you don't have a dyslexia diagnosis, well, you're in trouble. There are actually states, I don't recall which states, but thankfully it's the, it's the minority, um, that there are some states that would not give you anything unless you have that diagnosis. Well, easy, then I'll get the diagnosis if I actually have it. So, you know, it, it's, it's pretty obvious why we want to get the diagnosis if it's actually indicated, right? We're not handing it out like candy. If the child actually struggles, send them for an assessment, get them evaluated, talk to the teacher, raise, your, raise the concern so that we can actually figure out what is going on and identify strengths, weaknesses, and find the right interventions. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the assessment process because that's what I do. Um, so the assessment process goes like this. We start with doing an interview. We call it a clinical interview with the parents, with the guardians, somebody who is most familiar with the child. Talk to them for about half an hour, 45 minutes to try to understand what is the problem here. A lot of the times parents would come and they would say, um, my, pro my child has problems. And I go, what kind of problems? They can't read. What, what do you mean they can't read? So if you and I ever cross paths, don't get you know, offended if I ask you a lot of prompting questions, because unless I know what the problem is, I won't be able to, I won't be able to test accurately. I don't know what I'm testing for, right? I need to have a clear understanding of what the referral question is. So this is very, this is a really important first step. During the interview, 
you know, the, this examiner, it doesn't have to be any psychologist who does these evaluations would ask you, what is the problem? What is the concern? How is your child struggling? Give me some examples. Be prepared to explain. Paper and pencil tests, right? So that's the, the main part of the evaluation. Um, it's going to take about, well, here at ACIDS, when I do it, it's about four, four and a half hours. Um, call it psycho psychological evaluations or psychoeducational evaluations. I use these terms pretty interchangeably. So what the child is going to what the child is expected to do is to um, do a bunch of different activities that would involve reading, writing, um, playing some activities that seem fun. They'd be asked to memorize things, to test their memory learning, and all kinds of things. I'm gonna also, I also have a slide that talks about the different domains that I assess um, in these evaluations. So anyway, just to give you a, a, like an idea, the gist of it. Input from teachers. I also try to talk to the teacher if I can. Sometimes it's a little hard to get a hold of them. I send them questionnaires. Either way, I need input from teachers, and that's a critical part. Sometimes I see reports you know, prior, from prior evaluations, and there's no input from teachers. Schools don't like it. I'll be really honest. So when, if you're trying to get the school to collaborate, together with you, and if you go and find somebody to do an evaluation and that, you, that person never asks feedback from the teacher, the school's not gonna be happy. Well, you never talk to the teacher. How do you know this child is really struggling? So always get the teacher involved. Ask the teacher for feedback. The teacher really knows your kid well, right? We've got the parental perspective. We also need the teacher to tell us, me as an examiner. So how is this child really learning in the classroom. Oh, wow, you know what? It's not so much about the writing or the reading. It's really that, you know, Johnny is very anxious. Oh, okay, well, that's something that the parent never told me. Well, I'm surprised the parent didn't catch that because Johnny is really anxious. That tells me something, right? Additional information, that's helpful. Collateral information, like if there's any prior evaluations, you know, the examiner would be able to use that as a baseline comparison. So you're gonna be able to tell, oh, is there an, you know, an, an improvement in this area? Is there a reduction? What, how, what do we, you know, how do we explain that? What do we, how do we make sense of that? So that's also a use for information. If there's any school reports, that would also be taken into consideration. Clinical observations, that's pretty much my role. So when the child comes into the room, from the moment they set foot in, I'm gonna start observing them. Well, a child doesn't know. They'll think that, oh, I'm this really nice lady who's just trying to chat with them. No, not really, I'm observing you. So all the observations are actually included as part of the report, and that's really important because sometimes parents miss things. I'll give an example. So I recently tested a child, and the child is very, very hyperactive, extremely hyperactive and really inattentive. There, there's no sitting down. No, there's no four hours of pacing. And gladly, I have a huge office, a huge testing room. If you guys have visited, you'll know how big it is. So the child was able to get up, pace around, touch everything in my office. I'm not gonna stop him. Why? Because it's gonna go into my report. Um, parents have no idea that this is their child. Why? Because they've done so much to stop them from acting out around the house. The teachers have found a way to accommodate the child, that it seems like it's not a problem anymore. But when the child is in a new environment, when he really gets hyped up, it kind of shows his true colors. And that is okay, there's nothing wrong with it. That's who he is. But that gives me information. And so when I share that feedback with the parents, they go like, wow, really? And I go, wow, he's already nine, but you didn't pick that up? Well, not, not to blame them, but I, I was just honestly very surprised. So, you know, in the end, they were very receptive. They were happy that somebody actually pointed that out because they've always wondered, is this ADHD or is this not? Is this just my kid is being really, you know, hyperactive but not quite to the point where he needs medication? So anyway, so clinical observations um, are important. Feedback, that is, according to me, it's the most important part of the evaluation. Why? Because that is the time that I'm able to explain to the parents what I found. So some parents would prefer to just have the report, which is totally okay. Um, because they feel like, well, everything that I need to know is already written in the report, what's the point of you regurgitating it? Well, but if you think about, let's say I just did an MRI, the hospital sent me a copy of the MRI results. I'm gonna look at it and I go like, what does this mean? I'm only gonna look for keywords, unremarkable, normal, check in within six months, and then I'm done, you know? But no, there's a lot more there, you know, it, that there is to the report. So. I really would like to spend time on giving feedback to the parents because it helps me connect with the parents and parents often tell me a lot, even more information than what they have shared with me during intake. And that is the time that I can either explain to them why the kid has been acting the way it is. It's very therapeutic, 
And it also gives me the, gives them the buy-in to maybe seek therapy for the child, maybe to get them to talk to a pediatrician to think about medication if it's necessary. Um, if it's just a purely dyslexic case, then maybe interventions are really needed. Own it, claim it, accept the label, right? So there's a lot of therapeutic work that is actually done in the feedback, and it's not just data and crunching numbers and percentiles and all those boring stuff. Okay, these are some areas of assessment. Um, three main areas that I usually assess, cognitive function, academic skills, and um, social emotional behavioral skills. So cognitive functions, things that I would typically look for, uh, I'll look at um, intellectual ability, um, which is, you know, as you, all, you guys all know, it's IQ. Um, attention, concentration, visual motor skills, learning memory, language, executive functions. Now, um, here's a caveat. I don't always assess for every single domain in every child that comes my way. Why? Because if a child comes to me um, mainly because there is a question of dyslexia, there's no history of attention problems. I looked at the parent's report. I looked at the teacher's report. The teacher gave me feedback. No, the child is really attentive. They're really able to focus. There's never really a question or concern about attention. I'm still going to maybe give one or two subtests, but I'm not going to spend 45 minutes just to look at attention and concentration. It's not necessary. Some of you who have had experiences with um, maybe prior evaluations might, and hopefully, I hope that's not the case. You may have run, you, or you may have worked with people who would give 10-hour tests, write up, you know, a 40-page report. It's really not recommended. It is not necessary. What they're doing is called um, a fixed battery approach. So they pretty much use the same battery for every kid. That's why it's 10 hours. It should not be 10 hours. It does not have to be 10 hours. How many cases can you see if you see a kid for 10 hours and then another 15 hours of writing the report? You only see one case a week. So parsimony is the key, right? You want to give the right amount, the optimal number of tests that would allow you the right amount of data so that you can move on and focus and hone in really on the things that you really need an answer for. If the child is struggling with dyslexia, oh, by the way, this is the topic of tonight's talk. I'm digressing, sorry. Reading. <laughs> Well, because I'm a psychologist and I talk about mood all the time. So phonological processing, reading fluency, word recognition, and decoding. So if a child is referred for dyslexia, these are the four top areas that I'll absolutely, definitely assess. Recently tested a child and family sent her in because they wondered if she might be dyslexic. Results turn out to be completely normal. Average, high average range. And, and I, I preface the feedback by telling the parents, I don't know if you're going to be disappointed because I have nothing to share with you. They go like, oh my gosh, I thought I was crazy the whole time. No, I'm not. You know, So it was really validating. But why am I bringing this up? Because when I gave this girl the reading measures, nothing came up. So I gave her one measure of each. It just doesn't align with what the parents tell me or told me or the, what the teachers observed. And so I gave them, I gave the girl a little bit more of each because I really needed more data to substantiate my point. And it turns out that across the board, consistently, the girl scores in the average high average range. They're, it's not dyslexia, it's something else. So that's one example of how you would want someone to do a flexible battery approach and not a fixed one because you really need to answer the referral question. Writing and math are two other areas that I commonly assess. Um, reading and writing usually go together and hand in hand. Um, writing samples is, is pretty much a must. If it's a, you know, a learning disability evaluation, um, you want to be able to assess their mechanics, their grammatical um, knowledge, the semantic knowledge. Um, are they able to generate ideas? Are they able to write fluently? Um, is there a difference between their writing under time and untimed conditions? All things like that. Okay, finally, the mood and behaviors and social skills. So parents sometimes wonder why I even have to assess for that. Again, like I said, because I'm a psychologist, of course I have to ask these questions. No, the true reason is because we're not obtaining a holistic picture, a full picture of the child if we only look at specific pockets of how they do. If the child is anxious, they're not gonna be able to learn well whether or not it's related to dyslexia. If the child is depressed, they're not gonna be able to concentrate. Hey, guess what? Because people with depression, child, children or adults, people with depression or anxiety, they're going to mimic symptoms like ADHD. But they're not ADHD, they're just really nervous. So these are things that we really need to tease apart and have you know, an understanding for and being able to explain what is going on with this child. Is there a comorbid condition? Maybe it's ADHD with some depression, with dyslexia. Okay, then we now know what to treat and how to treat and be you know, a little bit more focused with the interventions.